Against the backdrop of Hurricane Ida, a deadly power outage, and the COVID-19 pandemic, ProPublica reporters will unpack how these disasters overwhelmed vital infrastructure in New Orleans, address inequities that arise in crises, and examine what New Orleans institutions have learned, if anything, from prior disasters. And now, I'll welcome our speakers. Annie Waldman is an investigative reporter covering education and other issues for ProPublica. She's based in New Orleans. Max Blau recently joined ProPublica's New South Unit, where he covers healthcare, public health, and the environment. Josh Kaplan is a senior reporting fellow at ProPublica. He has covered criminal justice, racial disparities, and most recently has been reporting on the events of January 6th. Our, moderate, our moderator today is Dua Adib. Dua is an investigative reporter covering health and inequity in ProPublica's Midwest newsroom. Before I hand it off, I want to note that this session is being recorded and a link to the video will be emailed tomorrow to everyone who registered. If you'd like to go ask a question, just click the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen and type it there. Thanks again for joining us and thanks to McKinsey and company for their support. I'll let Dua take it from here. Thank you, Connor. And thanks to all of you who are taking time out of your busy lives to join us tonight. You're here because you care. And we're lucky to have some of my favorite ProPublica colleagues with us who also care. I wanna begin by talking about the most recent crisis, Hurricane Ida. I remember reading David Ansel's book, The Death Gap, uh, where he wrote that we often think of extreme weather events as acts of God that are indiscriminate in their death and destruction, but we know that's not the case. Annie and Max, there's a line in your story that really struck me when I read it. You write, the most vulnerable New Orleans residents were left powerless by the city's most powerful company. Let's start there. Annie, can you tell us about the disproportionate impact of Hurricane Ida on the people who lost power and what it did living without power? What did that mean for the people who stayed? Yeah, thank you again for hosting this event and also thank you to everybody who can make it here tonight and join us. Um, so I want to first take us back to the days before the storm and set the scene a little bit. In the week before the hurricane made landfall, it was clear that Ida would be a huge storm and that it would pummel some part of the Gulf Coast, but it was really unclear exactly where it would strike. Many people in New Orleans are so used to predictions that a storm may hit the city that they often don't make plans until a couple days before landfall. And so for many New Orleanians with limited means, evacuating can be an incredibly expensive task. But of the people who decide to stay, cost wasn't the only factor. So for many people, it's frankly difficult to arrange an evacuation, in particular people with breathing machines or other medical devices or conditions. For example, in the days after Hurricane Ida, we met Wilma Banks, a native New Orleanian who lives in New Orleans East. She graciously spoke with us in one of her most difficult moments. She's lived through Hurricane Betsy, through Hurricane Katrina, and in the days leading up to Ida, it didn't look like it was going to be as catastrophic so she stayed. Wilma has congestive heart failure and COPD and asthma, and she requires two breathing machines, a nebulizer as well as a CPAP machine, both of which need to be plugged in in order to work. They're not battery operated. So after the storm hit, she spent days calling city agencies. First, she called 311. She also called the Special Needs Registry, which is an agency that was set up by the city to help people with medical needs. And when neither agency was helpful, she did what anyone might do in her social era, which is she tweeted at the mayor and at Entergy, the power company, trying to get help, trying to be heard, but she received no help. So on the sixth day without electricity, she started to struggle to breathe, so much so that she had to be rushed by ambulance to the ICU and hospitalized. There were cases where people didn't get help in time. So of the 14 people in New Orleans who died as a result um, of the storm, nine deaths were because of excessive heat during an extended power outage. And two were from carbon monoxide poisoning because families were turning to generators to power their homes. Power outages following hurricanes are somewhat common in New Orleans and in the region, but the scale and scope of the outage after Ida, it put lives at risk and it left many people in New Orleans questioning why did it unfold in this way and did it have to? Max, walk us through the power outage. Why did the power grid fail? So our reporting identified 
had several key reasons um, that that contributed to the failure. And I, and I should say before we dive into these, um, there is an ongoing investment be happening in months to come, where the company that or the the body that regulates the the new the council uh, will be look will be trying to answer um, and, and the full that question fully and to get a complete picture of, of what happened exactly. But based on what we know now and our what our reporting shows, um, you know there were the utility. We had found that the utility had made um, insufficient grid investments um, in terms that that led to failures happening related to its grid. And when we talk about the grid, we mean um, everything from utility poles to transmission uh, lines that that went down um, on the night that the storm hit New Orleans. There there had been eight, all eight of the, of the transmission lines that impacted uh, or that, that brought power to the city went, uh, went offline and remained that way for, um, for in, into, the, into the coming days. So that was one issue. Also found that there had been um, spending routine uh, maintenance um, in, in the years ahead. I think for, if you talk to folks in New Orleans, uh, one thing you'll hear is that there are outages that happen not just during Major storms, but on you know days when there's sunny weather and when it's sunny and outages are are, are a common uh, part of life there. And you know the the difference between there being a a, a two or three day um, power outage, which I think many residents, including Wilma Banks, um, are have have long been ready for, and, and um, was. You know that that is something that is normal. What is not normal in New Orleans is something that an outage that can last for a week plus. And so I think um, there's still questions to be answered. But but the insufficient grid investments and uh, in some cases the overstatement of of the company's equipment capabilities to supply reliable power after the storms also played a role. And as we all know, this happened in the midst of a pandemic. And the other crisis we're gonna talk about tonight is the treatment of COVID-19 patients at New Orleans' largest hospital system. Uh, we know when you know the COVID first hit that hospitals across the country were overwhelmed, but Annie and Josh, you found something different in New Orleans. Josh, can you tell us what you found? Yeah, so we started reporting on this uh, kind of at the tail end of the first wave of the pandemic. And as we were looking at the data of uh, trying to understand coronavirus deaths better, uh, we learned that in New Orleans, there was something unusual happening. Uh, people were dying at home of COVID at a much higher rate than was happening elsewhere in the country. Um, and as we started trying to, you know, understand those, uh, why that was happening and the, uh, understand those deaths. Uh, we learned that it wasn't really because people weren't going to the hospital or didn't know where to go. Uh, in dozens of cases, people had gone to the hospital first seeking care and then were sent home and died um, after they were discharged. Uh, and most of those patients, the vast majority, uh, were coming from one hospital system, uh, Ashna. And, you know, in, as we were talking to families, uh, you know, a number of families uh, said that they felt pressured into discontinuing care for their loved ones. And, you know, in some cases, we've been begging the hospital to try. Uh, and in one case, uh, we, we received medical records and uh, had experts review them. And they said that the patient uh, may have well have been able to survive if she'd uh, gotten more care. And so, I mean, and once this care was discontinued, uh, the hospice system itself was uh, not keeping up to the standards of care that are, are normal for hospice. Um, the, you know, patients were, uh, families were being, felt like they're being left alone to care for their loved one in this really difficult situation and that you know, they'd been un unable to keep their uh, you know, family members out of pain and uh, from suffering from the virus. and. Also, I mean, this was, you know, as you remember, the time when masks and PPE were hard to come by and the hospitals weren't giving 
that to families in, uh, in all cases or in many cases. And so sometimes family members were getting sick because of that, getting COVID themselves. Um, and so, I mean, this wasn't, uh, you know, ill will from the hospital. I mean, our reporting also found that the system was very overwhelmed, uh, you know, and, and nurses and doctors we talked to made clear that they, because of the extreme strain on the system, uh, they weren't able to always give the standard of care that they wanted to and were accustomed to. Uh, we also found really, uh, it seemed to be really serious racial disparities in how this was happening and how this was playing out. Um, in every case uh, we identified uh, where patients went to the hospital first uh, and then were discharged and passed away, uh, every one of the patients was Black. We're going to get to those uh, racial disparities in a minute. Um, but before we do, Annie, I want to uh, ask you a little bit about, you know, kind of how you found this story, how you knew what to look for. I remember when this was happening, we were hearing and, you know, you and I were reporting on, um, at least in Chicago, about, you know, families who their patients or loved ones were dying in the hospitals. How did you know to look for patients dying at home? Yeah, so since the pandemic began, as you mentioned, you know, many reporters at ProPublica have been trying to understand the disparities of COVID and also more generally how disparities can arise um, in healthcare. We really wanted to understand how COVID was impacting communities in a hyper local way. So you were part of this um, team. We all requested data from coroner's offices and medical examiners around the country um, during the first six months of the pandemic. And as you mentioned, first, we looked at Chicago. Not only were you on this team, but along with several other of our colleagues, we all attempted to reach out to the families and close friends of the first 100 people to die of the virus in Chicago. We were trying to understand if anything could have been done to prevent these deaths or improve the healthcare system more broadly. I live in New Orleans, and since the beginning of the pandemic, similarly, I have wanted to understand how the city's healthcare system handled the early surge of the virus because New Orleans, um, back in mid-March, as we all know too well, New Orleans became a, an early hotspot for COVID-19. Uh, the virus spread here exponentially. So through a records request, we received data from the New Orleans coroner's office and we started making calls. We called dozens of families and they were incredibly generous with their time and their stories. It was, it was not easy for many of them to open up and they were truly courageous um, to do so. And they told us the horrors that they and their families had been through um, as early victims in the pandemic. Many still had you know, extensive questions about what had happened and many were still deep in the grieving process. And it was really from these conversations as Josh mentioned earlier that we started hearing um, things that we weren't hearing in other cities. What was so surprising was that and so many other cities that we looked at, people were you know, exponentially dying in the hospital, just proportionately compared to prior to the pandemic. But in New Orleans, for whatever reason, there was a big uh, fraction of the deaths that occurred at home. Um, and at first we thought, you know, it could be that people just weren't getting to the hospital fast enough and the virus was progressing so quickly that people weren't able to get medical care in time. But as Josh mentioned, you know, in, in conversations with these families, we began to realize many actually sought care, many got care, but then were sent home. Um, and, and in many of these cases, patients were sent home to die with hospice care. It was completely alarming um, and something that we, we weren't expecting to find in the, you know, in our conversations with people. I remember being shocked when I uh, read your story at that point. I'm going to stay with you for a minute because you worked on both stories. And several of the people you met were reporting after Hurricane Ida faced medical problems that were exacerbated by the loss of power. Do you see a pattern between those who are stranded home alone during the power outage and those who are sent home to die? Yeah, that that is a great question. Um, well, of course, the first waves of COVID had a vastly different impact on the city than Hurricane Ida, both in terms of severity and also the specific effects. 
there are some very nuanced parallels. Do I, you open this conversation referencing the work of David Ansel, which I think is a, a completely appropriate way to kind of, you know, use him as a, as a light post for this conversation. For those who don't know who he is, he's a physician, an epidemiologist, and an author who's also a leading thinker in the world of health equity. Um, for those who haven't read his book, The Death Gap, Ansel investigated health disparities in Chicago and beyond, truly illuminating that there are vast differences in life expectancy between the wealthiest and the poorest neighborhoods, sometimes 35 years um, of a difference. And what Ansel described in stark detail was that in, in America, you know, if, if you are without means or without power, where you live can also dictate where you die. And, and truly, um, the structural violence of our society, whether it be discrimination, racism, uh, economic exploitation, um, is part, if not the full reason why. And so I think that that one parallel that I see in these two stories that we reported on is that the suffering of the individuals, whether it be with health disparities in COVID or disparities at the power outage, they were occurring in communities where structural forces have perpetuated inequality for decades. And the calls for help were there in both instances. This is what was so painful in the process of reporting. You know, many people were, were asking for help, were trying to seek help in some way, but they weren't answered and their voices weren't heard. So, you know, both the hurricane and COVID were, were both disasters that exposed the city's deep structural flaws, just as Katrina had, you know, years before. And as investigative reporters, we write not only about what happened, but why it happened. And, you know, we ask if the failures, the deaths, the trauma, the loss could have been prevented. Um, so Mask, I'm gonna get back to you. What do you think, um, you know, as, as Annie mentioned, hurricanes are nothing new in New Orleans. We know that. Was this power failure inevitable? I, I don't believe so. When you look back to Hurricane Katrina into the mid 2000s, um, you know, I, Hurricane Katrina was not a disaster of primarily of, of power outages, though there were it was like the, the largest extent of that damage happened due to the breaking of the levees and then the flooding that happened afterwards. And what you saw in the years that came after that were a, a $14.5 billion um, project to rebuild the levees and to, to, to improve flood management uh, within the city of New Orleans. In the, a few years after that, uh, hurricane, when, when Hurricane Gustav hit uh, Southeast Louisiana, there was a, you know, probably the closest example of a, of a precursor to Ida that um, the city has seen um, in the past 20 years, there was hundreds of thousands of people in Louisiana that lost power and all but one of the transmission lines uh, bringing power to New Orleans uh, had, fa um, had failed. And so there was a, a window that existed after Gustav and after the damage, the damage and the power failures that occurred uh, to make investments into the infrastructure, into the into the grid, um, to truly modernize it and make it um, equipped to handle storms that are hitting um, str stronger storms that are hitting more frequently um, as as climate change has um, has, has. And so there are you know what you saw instead of that kind of dramatic investment with the levees um, after Katrina. Instead, you saw poles being put up after storms, um, smaller repairs happening to get the grid back up and running, but there wasn't always the same kind of uh, dramatic investment to do things like uh, bury lines down or to, um, to make the system more resilient um, in terms of transmission lines that would uh, prevent as catas a, 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 to prevent the uh, scope of the outage um, from being the same as it was with Gustav. Annie, the story points out that uh, New Orleans has nearly double the federal poverty rate and its low income residents face one of the highest energy burdens in the country, second only to Memphis, according to a 2016 study that you all cited. 
how did Ida and its aftermath compound these issues? Yeah, so notably, as you mentioned, um, New Orleans low-income residents face one of the highest energy burdens in the country. And, you know, this was something that I don't think at the start of Hurricane Ida, when we started reporting on this, I don't think this is something we fully reckoned with until we started to have conversations with people. To give you a sense of kind of like what an energy burden means, you know, half of the city's low income households pay about 10% or more of their earnings on their energy bills. And a quarter of low income residents pay about 20% or more. So to give you a comparison, on average, households across the country pay about 3.5% of their income on their energy bill. So this is a drastic, um, you know, it, can, it has a drastic impact on families, especially low income families in the city. Um, to give you a sense of how this impacts people personally, I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, Grace Hollins, who she's one resident that we interviewed for our story, who's among the group of New Orleanians who spends a disproportionate amount on her electricity bill. Typically, she pays about $300 um, for energy charges each month. This is for a 1,200-foot uh, shotgun apartment house, um, one bedroom. It's almost a fifth of her and her son's total disability checks of about $1,600 a month. Uh, also, because of a misunderstanding, she ended up missing several bill payments and Energy New Orleans, her power company, cut off her electricity. So now she's on a payment plan that has nearly doubled her monthly bill. So on average, she normally just has to pay $300 a month. Now she's paying $590 a month, um, So which leaves her about $1,000 left um, to pay for everything else in her life. So including rent, including food, and including her son has cerebral palsy and he has a lot of medical expenses like diapers. So um, in a month when you have a hurricane like Ida um, or any kind of strong storm, it creates a completely unexpected financial burden, um, not only just how you uh, manage at, in the days following the storm, but also if you have to evacuate. Um, and so what happened with Grace was that she actually ended up using money that she would have set aside for her electricity bill to help get her son and her out of town. Um, after about a week, they evacuated to Atlanta uh, because her son has a seizure disorder and she was worried that in the hot days that followed Hurricane Ida that he might have a seizure. So I think what's important to be clear about um, here with Entergy and you know to really kind of put it in the most clear way possible. Um, Entergy and Entergy New Orleans, they have monopoly control over the city's electric grid. And so consumers like Grace, who, you know, have are living on limited means, they have little choice but to pay the company for light. You know, if they want their lights on, if they want their AC on, they have to go through Entergy and Entergy New Orleans. And without true competition, um, companies like Entergy make decisions that will make them the most money, that pose the lowest risk to their bottom line. And these decisions ultimately can have a negative effect on the people who are the most vulnerable. And that that's really what we found in our day-to-day -day reporting, speaking with residents all across the city. So when the company's electric grid failed for as long as it did in New Orleans, it really threatens to destabilize families like Grace um, or even family, you know, individuals like Wilma who might be living on the edge a little bit um, and who eventually, you know, have to leave or have other expenses that come up. And for many low-income residents, a prolonged outage like what happened in Hurricane Ida can also create lasting obstacles that if the power had come back on quickly, they would have been able to get over um, relatively easier. We've talked a lot tonight about this layering effect, poverty on top of disinvestment, on top of systemic racism. Um, Josh, going back to the um, sent home to die story, what do you see as the root causes of what went wrong at Ashner, and to what extent um, are they unique to New Orleans? Um, yeah, I mean, so I think there are two real underlying issues that are uh, the cause of what we found um, in this investigation. And I mean, the first is, is something, you know, really quite specific to New Orleans. This was simply the use of hospice for COVID patients at all. Uh, we talked to, you know, officials at hospitals and other uh, cities that were hit really hard during the first wave of coronavirus. So New York, Seattle, Chicago, 
And uh, the other hospitals we talked to said that they simply were not using, uh, they, they simply were not sending COVID patients home that were uh, for hospice care. And, you know, they also were overwhelmed just like Oshner was, but they, you know, one were worried that they would be getting people sick and risk exposing others to the virus uh, by, you know, sending uh, very ill patients home. And then also they, uh, COVID is such an aggressive disease and such a, a frankly, uh, brutal illness. Um, and it just didn't, they were worried about the quality of care that someone could get outside of a hospital setting um, from untrained professionals. Um, and so that was, if not unique to New Orleans, at least uh, quite unusual. And, and you know, it was exacerbated by the fact that uh, the hospice system wasn't built, it wasn't set up in a way that was guaranteeing that that transition would go smoothly and that people would get the standard of care that they should be able to expect from the hospice system. So if patients were, uh, you know, stuck at home without any hospice worker coming to see them for sometimes days at a time. Um, then the second issue, I mean, I think speaks to something much larger uh, in the pandemic, although, it, you know, we can get into it in a sec, manifest in specific ways in New Orleans, but it's just that, you know, palliative care and end of life care, you know, how we, how doctors and families make decisions together about how to best uh, take care of someone who is truly uh, extremely sick uh, is a really difficult system that was shot to all hell uh, by the strains of the pandemic um, and can have the people who bear the brunt of that often are uh, marginalized, come from marginalized communities and are the people, you know, who have the least uh, resources at their disposal to, you know, kind of force their way on the system. I have a follow-up to that. Um, it's something that you alluded to earlier. Of the two dozen or so patients who first sought care at an Ashner hospital and then died after they were discharged, often sent home to die with hospice care, all of them were black. What should we make of these racial disparities? Yeah, so I, I mean, and I think to really, you know, answer that, you know, fairly and seriously, you have to really, you know, talk about the, the end of life care system, which is, you know, deciding when you pull the plug, um, deciding, uh, you know, how to, prevent unnecessary suffering uh, of your loved one if you think they don't have that good of a chance of, of making it. Um, and I mean, these are you know, impossible choices where there's no right answer. And uh, as end of life care has, has become common, I mean, it, it really depends. It's a kind of uniquely delicate balance within medicine that uh, requires trust and a lot of communication and you know, also uh, time, which was short during the pandemic. And, uh, you know, even before COVID hit, normal times, uh, research had found that uh, Black people had disproportionately negative experiences with end-of-life care in a, in a number of ways. Um, and so uh, as hospitals were low on resources and were less able to do this, uh, do what they might normally do anyways, uh, I think it made a lot of sense that uh, these disparities were uh, made worse uh, in these harsh conditions. I mean, and I, you know, we wrote this at a time where the conversation on racial disparities and COVID uh, was pretty limited to you know, pre-existing conditions and uh, different living conditions in different uh, groups uh, that might expose someone to the virus more. Um, but it was made what this, I think our reporting made really clear to us and uh, hopefully sparked some conversation about was that, you know, those disparities also exist in the hospital, not through ill will necessarily, but, you know, the end of life care particularly, but other forms of care, um, you know, are uh, guided by so many small decisions that can be influenced by structural forms of racism that uh, can manifest in this sort of uh, really stark and disturbing result. Uh, 
at ProPublica, we're all about you know, accountability and, and impact. So you may be able to guess my next question, um, which is, you know, who's to blame here? Um, and I'm going to open this up to all of our panelists because I want to hear from all of you. But I mean, really, when you look at both of these stories, who had the ability to change things um, but didn't? We received several questions from the audience in which, you know, people express their frustrations and their anger. What can they do to push for reforms? I guess I'll jump in first and uh, do a, a short response to your last part of your question, um, which is, you know, how when people read our stuff and how when they get upset, you know, how can they either push for reforms or participate or engage in some way? Um, and, you know, uh, as ProPublica journalists, we always go by the saying that sunlight is the best disinfectant and transparency and shining a light on issues. Um, I think is the start to any conversation uh, toward reform or changing a, a system that is kind of entrenched with inequities. And so I have to give a short and shameless plug that, you know, for people who are here and they have knowledge that something is wrong and that it should be fixed in some way, finding data and reaching out to reporters and helping us investigate things and bring stuff to light, um, that's critical. You know, as reporters, we rely on readers and um, people who we engage with uh, outside of our newsroom to really flag for us what's important, flag for us what we should be looking into. Um, so I'll, I'll keep it short. Um, so definitely send us tips. On the uh, energy and hurricane side, I think it is, um, it is really easy um, for people to blame energy. And of course they do share, you know, they, they do hold responsibility for what happened with the power failure. Um, the way that power is like the, the, the way that power is regulated and and who is really held accountable is is more complex than that it is a um it is a collaborative process that exists between a power company and the body that regulates and that, that's true in new oil and elsewhere there's an investor-owned utility that um promises to provide safe and reliable power in exchange for having exclusive territory um, in, a, in a particular region. Um, and so what you, what you see in New Orleans is there's a really like a fairly unique um, setup in which Entergy New Orleans, which is a subsidiary of, of the, the larger Entergy, is regulated by the New Orleans City Council, which also um, handles everything from trash pickup to, to other city services. And, um, as opposed to like a state public service commission, which only focuses on utilities and has experts on staff to, uh, really complex decisions around how utilities should, uh, what they should inv invest in and, and how they can collect money from uh, their customers. And what we have found in, in our reporting is that, um, this setup in which a very powerful company or subsidiary of, a, of, a, of an even larger company um, can ha has time again overpowered city council members in terms of that, that don't have the sufficient resources or expertise to effectively re regulate the company it's supposed to be uh, watching over. This has gotten better um, in recent years. Um, and, and I think one example of that is that there is an investigation that's happening and that is a first step. Um, but I, I think if, if folks want to see um, reforms come in, on, in terms of energy and Hurricane Ida, being involved in the process of uh, how going to council meetings and, and speaking to, to folks at a local level um, that have the ability to make those decisions is um, one, is one of the, the best ways of doing that. Um, we also, one of the things that we also do at ProPublica is try to reflect on lessons learned. Um, Annie, what do you think uh, New Orleans institutions have learned, if anything, from prior disasters and what specific lessons do you think can be drawn from these two investigations? Yeah, so I think it would be wrong of us to not mention Katrina uh, a little more in depth at some point. 
what happened with Katrina was truly a textbook example of how natural disasters lay bare latent structural bias in our society, um, racism, discrimination, neglect. Um, some people have called it an unnatural disaster for that reason, or even a man-made disaster. Uh, I'm also going to plug uh, uh, the Floodlines podcast, which is really a fantastic podcast about Katrina um, that the Atlantic did with Van Newkirk. You should all listen to it. But um, when Katrina hit the city, the city had a quote unquote good Samaritan plan, essentially calling for people with cars to help people who didn't have cars because the mandatory evacuation order came only 20 hours before the storm actually made landfall. And because the evacuation order came so late and the city's officials were really relying on the residents to kind of help each other out, this left many vulnerable people stuck in their homes. And after Katrina hit and the city flooded, the people in power actually blame those who stayed for their own misfortune. I mean, even if you turn to the response of the, the FEMA, um, the FEMA, the head of FEMA at the time, Michael Brown, he attributed the deaths um, to choices of people who did not leave. But it truly wasn't about choices. I mean, structural inequities are rarely about individual choices. So with COVID and with Ida, what have we learned? Um, I believe that more people are aware of structural inequities and how they persist and how they can lead to tragic circumstances. But I think that off, all too often people in power, whether it be politicians, decision makers, um, doctors, power company executives, I mean, even journalists, um, they don't always question the power imbalances or how our actions might be worsening or neglecting persistent disparities. And in some cases, there might be people in power who are in fact exploiting these structural imbalances or companies or agencies that are exploiting these structural imbalances. So besides a very obvious lesson that we should be interrogating our actions and the effects of our actions um, and, you know, they have on others, I think it's clear that our society needs to have a deeper investment in vulnerable communities, both financial and emotional, so that we're not having these moments of reflection only when disaster strikes. I mean, we shouldn't be having, you know, a Slack chat or like, you know, a Zoom meeting about crises only weeks after Ida or a hurricane or the next, you know, um, pandemic wave. We should be having these persistently throughout the year. And I would add that we shouldn't be having the same ones over and over and over again. Um, Josh, it's been a year since you and Annie reported on Oshner. Uh, what happened um, after that? What investigation, what impact did your investigation have? Uh, yes, I mean, it, unfortunately, the answer is not as simple or as satisfying as I think uh, anyone might hope. But um, I mean, we did, we know we started some conversations, which take that as you will. But we've heard from a lot of a lot of doctors around the city, um, not just at Ashton, not just people we talked to about, you know, they were glad that this story came and they were glad that uh, it forced people to think about issues in a time where you know, everyone was working so hard that it was uh, easy to not be cognizant of uh, the harms that were being caused by some of these patterns. Um, but at a more official level, I mean, so after, after the story came out, uh, legislators were received a lot of emails uh, about them, and uh, the Louisiana Legislative Black Caucus uh, wrote a letter to the governor demanding an investigation uh, into uh, what transpired. Um, he met with uh, the caucus, uh, agreed to this, um, and there was uh, last year a, a, an investigation by the state health department, uh, which was pretty narrow and uh, done quite quickly uh, into simply the question of you know, whether or not any regulations were broken. Um, and it found that there were no regulations broken uh, by Oshner. Um, there was also uh, talk of both, you know, by the governor and uh, the caucus itself of doing um, a much larger and, uh, you know, kind of more in-depth study of, of what happened through a third party that you know, some people in the caucus felt would be better positioned to, you know, speak without uh, bias or, you know, potentially political favor. Um, and it's possible something has happened that we're uh, not aware of, but, you know, when we last checked in with the legislators, uh, you know, a couple of months, several months after the story or several months ago, 
they were themselves trying to figure out what was going on with this uh, and whether it was actually going to happen. Um, so that, that I don't know uh, doesn't mean it necessarily hasn't, but it's still on the table. Uh, but and people still have pushed for it, but to our knowledge, it hasn't happened yet. No second, Annie's plug earlier, asking for tips and sources and you know anyone with information about that or anything else to reach out to us. That's really um, one of the key ways we do our jobs. Uh, I wanna end with one last question before we um, move to the audience submitted questions. And this is something I wanna hear everyone's thoughts on. Um, this is, you know, we, we've looked um, back and I want to look forward. What lies ahead? Uh, what choices do you think that Intergy and Ashner face? What choices do the residents and patients of New Orleans face? I'll take it. I, I, um, so I, I want to go back to something that Annie mentioned earlier in terms of how we shouldn't be having these conversations, you know, in the days or weeks after a crisis. You know, um, when, when we spoke with experts um, about um, what needs to happen moving forward, um, new, you know, one of the things we, we I, I kept hearing over over and over again was that this conversation about making power grids more resilient is a conversation that needs to happen every single day of the year. And so I think now as city council and, and the Louisiana Public Service Commission are, are um, starting to look at what happened and, and ultimately figure out the reasons behind the failures, um, that's not enough um, to fix the underlying issues. What needs to happen also in addition to that is um, a, a, a dramatic investment looking at uh, that, that, that solves the underlying issues um, related to the grid. And, and so those are some of the, 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 the things moving forward. Yeah, and I wanna jump in really quickly there as well, just to remind people that like, even though New Orleans has its power back on, there are still lots of people without power, without homes to live in, who are living in tents next to their destroyed homes who don't have FEMA funding and the river parishes, for example, like we, it would be insane for us not to mention that they were struck way harder than New Orleans as a city was. Um, and, you know, there continues to be daily reporting on this from local reporters who are really illuminating um, the stark reality, which is that, you know, the story continues, like people still aren't getting their services. and. Anyway, I just want to, you know, we're, we're talking about this as though the story is almost uh, hit like an end of a chapter or like that it's over, but it's not. And, and people suffering continues. And I think that that's an important thing to always remember and keep in mind when we're having these conversations. Um, but also, I want to note on, on that note, there are some incredible local reporters who, you know, we have relied on their reporting to help us. Um, whether it be, you know, Emily Woodruff, who's at the Times Pick and the Advocate, who's a healthcare reporter there, who's fantastic and has done a lot of meaningful reporting both around COVID and also um, uh, related to Hurricane Ida, as well as Michael Isaac Stein at The Lens um, and The Lens in general, which is another fantastic local nonprofit here in New Orleans. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that we give them a little shout out because they do really incredible work um, that, you know, without these kind of local institutions, there's no way that even national institutions like us could come in and try to hold systems accountable. Absolutely, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, we're going to now transition to uh, questions that were sent in by the audience. Uh, there were so many of them that we won't be able to get to all of them, but we'll do our best to get to as many as we can. Um, we had several questions you know, revolving around the issue of preparedness. Uh, mask, Max, one reader asks, uh, why are utilities slow to prepare for these crises? Why do we continue to remain unprepared for infrastructure failure? And how should communities mobilize to hold them accountable? One of the things you're seeing uh, after Ida and to which has happened in the past is um, energy, energy will say that they need, they there's a choice that, that, that needs to happen. They either need to get funding from the federal government to help offset um, 
costs to to modernize the grid or to to get things back to normal or they're going to have to increase the uh the monthly bills of their customers and um you know in in the middle of that decision you know it's sort of a false binary you know that that they're offering to louisiana people in louisiana because you know they are as a as a monopoly guaranteed um profit um for everything that they do um and they could potentially take you know a cut away from shareholders and, and come up with a plan to dramatically invest in in modernizing its grid um but they done that um and and so far they've indicated that they are not going to be doing that moving forward with ida they either want federal aid um potentially you know either in the form of of grants or from infrastructure bill um or our warning the cost would have to be borne by by customers as to what communities um mobilize to hold them accountable i think uh, i touched on this earlier but um you know this unique things about new orleans is that the local the people who are regulating energy are your are our council people that are now in the middle you know less than two months less less than two months away from a uh a um camp a, a citywide election and so you know you now is the perfect time to like put you know to talk to the people who are tasked with regulating energy because uh you're if you, if you live in the city of new orleans you have the chance to to vote for them or vote for someone else. Thanks, Mac. Uh, the other issue that came up a lot in the audience questioned was, you know, comparing the aftermath of Katrina and Ida. And one reader wanted to hear the panelists reflect on the differences more than the similarities of the two. And Annie, you already kind of touched on this earlier, but I'm wondering if you can expand on that a little bit and uh, whether you think the city learned anything um, different from Katrina than from Ida. Yeah, so I would love to. Katrina was an unparalleled event. So I think that it's very hard to compare other storms or even crises to kind of the singularity of that moment. Um, that said, let's put the two storms side by side. I mean, Katrina was a cat three at landfall compared to Ida, which was a cat four. Katrina's winds were 125 miles per hour compared to Ida's, which you know went up to 150 miles per hour at landfall. Um, Ida even had a greater storm surge um, than Katrina. So I think like, you know, if you compare the storms side by side, I mean, they were both extremely catastrophic storms, but the difference really was with Ida, the levees didn't fail. Um, you know, the levees since Katrina have been rebuilt as Max brought up earlier with a price tag to a tune of $14.5 billion. And the city had the city had these levees during Katrina. I mean, I think that would have been a lot more resilient um, if they had been properly built back then. Um, but ultimately there were grave construction errors um, by the Army Corps of Engineers uh, when the levees were built and about 80% of the city flooded with Katrina. So another key failure in Katrina was the government took roughly a week to put in place a thorough rescue effort, which left tens of thousands of people stuck in the city without shelter, without food, without water, because they were unable to evacuate before the storm, during the storm, and even after the storm. And so while there was no post-storm evacuation plan in place after Ida, the city also didn't flood, so many people could still live in relatively workable homes while the power was being fixed. So I would venture to say that neither the levies nor the federal government responses were central issues with Ida, but nonetheless, um, there were structural issues that were laid bare um, in Katrina that persisted today, which makes any strong hurricane an incredible risk for vulnerable, vulnerable people in the city. One example, that came up in our reporting, it wasn't so much in our article, but I think that it's worth mentioning, um, was the special needs registry um, that the city set up. So uh, I mentioned this at the beginning of this event um, when I was speaking about Wilma Banks, who lived in New Orleans East. She was part of this special needs registry. So what it was, was after Katrina, the city set up a registry so that before hurricanes or other um, extreme disasters, uh, the city can connect with people in wheelchairs, with people with medical devices, people with oxygen tanks, or those in bed rest. 
And I believe that the program was put in place so that the great death toll of vulnerable individuals that happened during Katrina wouldn't happen again. Um, the city would be able to connect with the most fragile and make sure that they had the support that they needed before, during, or after a hurricane. So what was so striking was that a few days after Hurricane Ida, I was walking door to door in Central City. Um, a lot of people were out on their porches um, because it was so hot and humid that week uh, with a heat index of above 100 degrees. And I spoke with a handful of people who had special needs, who reached out to the city prior to the storm. They were on this special needs registry. Um, one woman I spoke with who was in a wheelchair, her wheelchair was at like 20% battery by the time I spoke to her. She told me that she connected with the city's special needs registry, packed a go bag, put it by the door, expect to be evacuated, and no one ever showed up. I mean, the city agency never showed up. They never responded to her request for help. And this was something that was echoed in a lot of things that we heard from other people, maybe not to that extent, but you know, Wilma Banks was tweeting at the city about the special needs registry, asking for help, asking why this plan that was supposedly put in place never came for her, never helped her. And we reached out to the city and we didn't receive a direct response from them about the special needs registry. So, you know, I think that yes, Katrina made it clear that the city has a responsibility for its most vulnerable individuals. And the city even created systems, put and they put systems in place or safety nets for people so that if another Katrina happened, these people would have somewhere to go or they would have a plan. But having that plan go into action is a whole other thing. And I am not sure that the city has that down yet. Josh, another reader wanted to understand more about the reporting process. They write, uh, what were some of the challenges you faced when finding sources for the story on patients being sent home to die? How did you overcome them? How did you get doctors to agree to retroactively evaluate some of the cases you mentioned? Um, yeah, so I mean, the most important sources for us in this story were uh, the families of, of patients um, who were uh, grieving and, uh, you know, we reached them at, frankly, a, a horrible time in their, uh, for the family. Um, although they were also, you know, some of the most eager to help and to, uh, you know, they, they were, were upset and, you know, starting to understand this was a broader problem and were, you know, eager to help us, uh, uh, as one put it, you know, shine light in the darkness on this. Um, I mean, nurses and doctors and getting inside the hospital was a little trickier. I mean, Oshner had essentially, you know, told its employees that they cannot talk to the press at all. Um, and there was also, um, you know, because we want to be honest with people as we're calling them, like, this is going to be a tough story. We're hearing some things from patients that we think need to be told. Um, you know, there, there, there's a, a, a bit of a, um, you know, defensiveness, I think, because they were working there, you know, really hard. And they knew, you know, the system was strained and uh, a lot of them really believed in, you know, what them and their colleagues were doing, understandably. Um, but, you know, I think we were able to communicate that, you know, we, we're, we're going to report this, but we need to be able to show what you guys are going through. We need to be able to show uh, you know, what it looks like in this strained system. And so we're able to you know, earn people's trust that we would uh, try to really capture the, you know, uh, horrible situation that was going on inside uh, some of these hospitals at different points. Uh, as for uh, the doctors who you know, went on, the, uh, reviewed these medical records and went on the record, I mean, I mean it was a process. Uh, I won't lie to you, you know, Annie and I spent a while uh, trying to find people who would do this. Uh, I mean, it was a time when, you know, the pandemic was still raging. Uh, you know, people were busy. No one really wanted to, you know, critique a colleague who was probably trying their best in difficult circumstances and you know in some cases like Dr. Lutz who you know is an Oshner doctor you know is at personal risk to him to speak on this um, but I mean we, the doctors we spoke to were uh, we built up trust and you know their belief that this was you know important for uh, the public to understand and also I mean I think it uh, key to that was just from a reporting perspective as we really 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 learned every page of these you know hundreds and hundreds you know 700 pages of medical records so we could say you know, what about on page you know 573 uh when this number changes like what do you make of that and we're able to kind of 
you know, as they're man themselves managing the crisis, be able to not spend too much time with us. Uh, along those same lines, Annie, another question um, was, uh, what is the most difficult part of reporting on such issues? Yeah, I mean, to echo what Josh said, I mean, we ask so much of people when we show up on their doorstep or we call them on the phone. Um, we are asking them to open us, open up to us when many are still in the very, very early days of grief. And some people haven't even really started to process what they're going through at all. And, and it is so much to ask somebody to share, not just their emotional journey, but also as investigative reporters, we ask so many detailed questions that frankly can be quite overwhelming. Um, so every time someone is willing to speak and share, it's truly a testament to their courage um, and their resilience of being able to kind of open up at it's such a challenging moment. But truly the most difficult part is asking so much of people who owe the world nothing, who owe us nothing, um, and asking people to open up. But I think people do share because they know the power of their testimony and they know the power of sharing that truth and what it holds. And, you know, for us, it's a huge responsibility um, as reporters to take that truth and try to hold other people accountable with it. Um, but, you know, it's our goal is really to make sure that we do right by the people who um, share so much with us. Thank you, Annie, and I, um, I think we're probably going to need to end there to wrap it up, um, and uh, what an important note to end on, because we are so grateful to anybody who opens up to us and who lets us share their stories, so um, when we, we do, it carries so much um, weight to make sure that we give justice to their stories, and we do our best, so thank you to everyone who has, um, you know, who, who spoke to all of you for their stories and hopefully will speak to us uh, in the future. Um, and Connor, I will uh, turn it over to you to close us out. Great. Well, thank you all. Uh, thank you to our panelists, Annie, Josh, and Max, and our moderator, Dua, for this excellent conversation. Thank you to the audience for joining us today and for all your thoughtful questions. If you enjoyed this conversation, we're hosting another event on Thursday called The Climate Gap in Housing, which examines how climate change has magnified the affordable housing crisis. You can register at propublica.org slash climate gap. From all of us at ProPublica, thank you for joining us. Have a great rest of your day, and I hope to see you next time.